For those of us that understand the truth and understand what we're really seeing week in, week out, and not falling into the WWE narrative, every week we flip on SmackDown on Fox for two hours, it feels like all we do is show up and win, baby. Just like our hero, the Tribal Chief, Roman Reigns. Woo! Again, I just can't help but ask the question, is how could you look at Raw and even NXT and then look at SmackDown and come to the conclusion that these shows are all put on by the same company, the same producers, the same agents, the same creative. Like, how is that even possible? Because while not perfect, SmackDown feels like the type of two-hour wrestling show you actually would be somewhat proud of telling other people you'd want to watch and that they would want to watch and that you enjoy watching. And you would never say that about Raw, that's for sure. And I don't even know if any of the NXT diehards will even say that about NXT anymore. It's just crazy to me how that's all kind of worked out. Like, how can you reconcile that? That the same company that puts on Raw every Monday night puts on this SmackDown show. It's fascinating. And you kick off SmackDown here with a title defense for Sasha against Bayley. And you know for the Sasha Bank stands and the Sasha fans and just the viewers in general, like... They're wondering how this is going to go. Like, really some clenched toll rings about whether or not Sasha was actually going to have a successful title defense. She ain't got a lot of them, that's for sure. So you're wondering, like, they're kicking off the show here. It's going to be a straight-up legit match. Like, how is Sasha going to lose this? The fact that the match was pretty good, it was intense, it was brutal, it was exactly what you would expect these two to do, feels like a secondary story. It honestly does. This is a perfect example to me that the only thing that mattered was the finish. Sasha actually not only won clean, but made Bailey tap. Is Sasha actually going to get a legitimate title reign here? She's actually successfully defending the SmackDown Women's Championship? Holy hell! What's going on here? Feel like I'm in Bizarro World. And then it come crashing back down to reality where they can't even let Sasha have the glow and the, the shine for one moment. Because now you're going to send Carmella after. Carmella! Carmella! For those of you that are going to suggest certain things about how they just couldn't let Sasha have her moment without letting the blonde get her shine in, you know what? I don't know if I'll go all the way there, but goddamn, they couldn't have just let this roll for another week before they stepped into that? Maybe it was the right way to do it, the right time to do it, but do we really need Carmella? Like when we're asking for people to, for Sasha to feud with, was Carmelo the answer you really came up with? Now maybe, just maybe, if you're saying, well, maybe she'll at least hold off Carmella and she'll actually get a couple of successful title defenses before she ultimately jobs out to Charlotte. You know, then maybe I get it and I can understand it. But otherwise, interesting. But really good match and Sasha won. Tapping out Bailey, big surprise to me. The whole drama throughout the night between Ray and Dominic and Aaliyah and Buddy Murphy... Like, it was okay when it was on Raw because I can always not tune in and not watch it, but now it's here. It is some days of our lives crap. You got people complaining on Twitter that Ali is 19 and Buddy's in his early 30s at Newsflash, people. They're both adults now. That happens all the time. I even got like sugar daddy sites and shit. Like, let's not pretend like Ali is some innocent victim here. All right, come on now. It might be uncomfortable to you, but it's just reality. Like, it happens way, way more than you think. People with 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 years of age difference. So like, they're adults, you know, so get over it. Um, you know, the matches, you had a couple of the Survivor Series qualifying matches, King Corbin and Rey Mysterio and Otis and Seth Rollins. Like, it's less about these matches, even though you got Corbin winning, you got Seth Rollins winning. It's more about what's the dynamic here with Aaliyah and Buddy Murphy and Seth Rollins. Now Buddy Murphy's calling Seth the Messiah, but he's telling Aaliyah to trust him. All the while, Ray and Dominic are sitting there trying to impose their will over Aaliyah, even though she's a grown-ass woman. Like, she's going to sit there and listen to you anyways. Like, the only thing that would make this more believable to me, other than the fact that it's clearly obvious that Buddy's not a good dude, so you shouldn't be involved with him in any way, um, that you could see in that she's now in love with him. Like, that, that feels real. The only way that this would make even more sense to me is ha to have Ray and Dominic then flip 
and then say, hey, you know what? We like Buddy Murphy. We're cool with Buddy Murphy. We're happy you're with him, and we're happy that you're happy because, man, Aaliyah would drop him like a bad habit if this is real-world shit. And you guys know what I'm talking about. You ladies know what I'm talking about, too. Now, if you went somewhere like that, like that then I could totally and completely get behind this story. Um, you had a women's SmackDown triple threat qualifier match for Survivor Series. Ruby Riot ends up beating Natalia. Like, why is Natalia still a thing? Was the farting gimmick really that bad for her? I'm just saying. Now, she's one of those ones that perseveres and continues to have a job, but does she ever really move the needle? Does she really ever do anything for anybody? I'm just saying. You had Big E and the Street Profits backstage and the Street Profits trying to sit there and get some intel on the New Day coming up for Survivor Series. And there's this weird thing with Billy Kay coming in and showing off her resume like... I didn't really get that one. Maybe I just wasn't that mentally present last night watching SmackDown. That could very well be what it was. I just, I don't know. Like, wasn't really jiving with that. Uh, the Lars Sullivan interview, I will at least say this. They wouldn't be doing this spot if Vince wasn't a believer. They wouldn't be doing this spot if Vince didn't care. If Vince didn't think that he could actually get this guy over. I'm not seeing it. A lot of you aren't seeing it. You're seeing a Snitsky or a Heidenreich that no matter how much you try, it's not going to work, but he is going to persist. And sometimes, just like with petulant children, you got to do the same thing with Vince. you got to humor him, unfortunately, and let it play out, and eventually he'll get bored with it and move the fuck on. There's a whole time, beyond the tired tropes of the, the WWE with their heels of, I don't like bullies, but then I became a bully, and I really like being a bully type of crap. It's just, the whole time I'm sitting there watching this Lars Sullivan interview with Michael Cole, you know, I'm getting those Heidenreich, butt rape and Michael Cole vibes. And I know, by no means, am I the only one that got those. Like, that's not the reaction you want to get out of people like me if you want this character to get over. The interview itself was dumb. <laughs> like, I don't know what you're trying to do here, and I just don't know that it's working. But you can't win them all. But what you can win with is everything involving Roman Reigns. Now, let me tell you about this son of a gun this week. This is why he's our tribal chief. This is why he's our hero. This is why he is the number one star in professional wrestling today. This is why he is unquestionably the top babyface in professional wrestling today. It all starts in the early part of the show where Kevin Owens wants to get in some cracks on Jey Uso. That was unprovoked. That was uncalled for. Like, here's Jey finally coming to his senses, falling in line, making his necessary babyface turn, because he knows his babyface turn is going to produce the biggest boom to his career to date and make him more money than he's ever made before in the business, and you always got to have the white devil hating on him in KO here, this Teletubby ass. And not surprisingly, Jey Uso, still adjusting to life, falling in line behind the Tribal Chief. You know, he's going out there and he's booking his own engagements here and booking interviews with Caleb Braxton. That did not get the Tribal Chief's approval. You don't always have to agree with or understand what the Tribal Chief does. But he does it for a reason. Because he cares, Jay. Because he loves you and he is, loves the family and he's trying to protect you and protect the family. So you shouldn't be surprised when Paul Heyman puts an end to your interview by saying that you need to get approval from Roman Reigns first. That is totally reasonable for a person in his position. And then when Roman Reigns comes out and says to Paul Heyman, you know, that you need to let me know when this stuff happens. Like, did you know about it before I did about the whole KO crap? I'm like, it might be Paul Heyman, but this is goddamn Roman Reigns. You're not dealing with Brock freaking Ruff Lester anymore. Like, this is the big leagues. Paul Heyman knows better and needs to sometimes be scolded when he doesn't fall in line him to himself. And watching as Paul Heyman is, you know, like orgasmically riveted but also terrified of Roman in the monster that's been created. I guess that's really cool to see. And I also appreciate the fact Roman's sitting there and letting Jay know, by God, that we're not going to have that type of disrespect. The three things you got in this world as a man, your word, your boss, those first two come from Tony Montana, and then your respect. You gotta have those three. You gotta hold on to those three as much as you possibly can. 
Kevin Owens has disrespected Jey Uso. He has disrespected Roman Reigns. He has disrespected the entire family. In a message must be sent that this will not be tolerated on the SmackDown locker room, in the SmackDown roster. This will not be tolerated in WWE. So Roman sets up the match to close out the show. Kevin Owens versus Jey Uso. And Kevin Owens learned a lesson. Now, personally, I think Jey Uso should have taught him the lesson even harsher. Like, it kind of let KO off the hook easily here. But the lesson was taught. Do not mess with the Samoan dynasty. Do not mess with the tribal chief. Do not mess with his family. Or there will be consequences and repercussions. And I am here for every single bit of it. While you necessarily didn't get a lot of clarity about who he's going to feud with next, is it going to be Daniel Bryan? Is it going to be somebody else? The fact of the matter is, is it wasn't really needed this week. It's another week where Jey Uso is main eventing SmackDown, helping his family out. That's what Roman does, what Top Babyface does. You know, and you could see the spawning of something really special here. Rome wasn't built in a day. But Roman's building this dynasty up very, very quickly, I promise you. And no surprise, Roman Reigns shows up. The Samoan family, the Samoan dynasty wins. It's that simple. Just show up and win. You leave the wrecking everyone and leave to the big dog, the tribal chief. But a good run here for Jey Uso. Good finish for the Samoan dynasty. What else would you expect? So you're going to ask me, what did I think of SmackDown this week? Of course I enjoyed it. The Lars Sullivan stuff, notwithstanding, because that was dumb. You know, the, the whole Aaliyah, Buddy Murphy, Ray Dominic angle, like I could do without. But I haven't been so embedded in and watching it every single week for months that it annoys me yet. I'm sure I'll get there very quickly. But this Roman J stuff and all of this that was built throughout the show, like just fantastic and then you know the first half hour of the show like the one thing that really stood out to me about smackdown for this week is your first half hour was basically tied up with bailey and sasha for the smackdown women's title a half hour or a two hour show 25 percent of it's booked built up or taken up just with that one match like this show flew by this week absolutely flew by so even the bad things or the dumb things didn't really stand out that much because you just didn't have enough time to really spin on them or worry about them so I enjoyed SmackDown a lot this week. I hope you enjoyed this review. I hope you're enjoying everything that you're getting out of this Samoan dynasty, out of the Roman Reigns babyface run, because this is what we've been asking for for years old. So smash that subscribe button so that way you can get on all the action on all these great videos here on OTRS Central. I'll see you later.